that was the Nature 2000 network of sites. Um, what the Habitats Directive and Birds Directive put in place is a process for driving sustainable, environmentally sustainable solutions to economic development uh, in areas where nature is important. So the Natura 2000 network of protected areas that these two directives establish uh, is now a network of more than 26,000 sites, um, covering, I think it's now 18% of the EU's terrestrial area. The network is still incomplete, so notably in the marine environment, um, uh, there is uh, a lack of sites um, and the Commission is working with member states, taking action against some member states to try and fill that gap. Um, BirdLife Europe that I mentioned before um, has had a role in this network of sites through its work to identify IBAs, so important bird areas. These are sites that on the basis of scientific evidence are important for birds. That network of IBAs that BirdLife Europe has identified has been used at European level by the European Court of Justice to as a baseline really for what member states should have done under the Bird Directive, so as a, as a baseline for taking legal action against member states that have failed to do anything. So this network is there to try and protect um, Europe's wild species, but some of the scientific evidence we have shows that biodiversity is still in trouble. So evidence gathered by RSPB scientists shows that and farmland birds in particular have declined dramatically since the birds directive was adopted um, while other birds like common human birds in total common forest birds have not declined so sharply uh, nevertheless what the scientific evidence also shows is that the birds directive is working so against the overall picture of declining biodiversity the birds for which action is being taken underneath, uh, under the birds directive are recovering. So as the scientific paper published by RSPB scientists shows that there is a significant improvement in the status of the birds protected um, under Annex 1 of the birds directive. These are the birds for which special measures must be taken and for which SPAs must be designated. And again, what this graph now shows is that those Annex 1 species are doing significantly better than those species not listed in Annex 1. The research also showed that the same species is doing better within the EU as compared to outside the EU. So these directives are working where they are being implemented. There is also a lot of evidence to show that they're delivering economically important ecosystem services. Data from the UK shows that every one pound spent on maintaining triple SIs is delivering benefits to society worth over eight pounds. Across the whole of Europe, the benefits that flow from the Natural 2000 network are worth between 200 to 300 billion euros a year. Total carbon value of up to 1.1, sorry, 1,130 billion euros. Um, and Natural 2000 related tourism is generating significant uh, income and providing many millions of jobs across the EU as well. Data at UK level is showing that insect pollinated crops are worth at least 14.2 billion euros for the EU and more than half and more than 600 million euros for the UK. So Natural 2000 sites is delivering significant benefits, but the picture is that biodiversity is still declining but the picture is also that these directives have not been fully implemented. The directives present a toolbox and many of the tools are still sitting. So what's the political background to the situation with the fitness check? Um, environmental regulation has been a target in the UK through things like the Red Tape Challenge, the Habitats Regulations Review, the Balance of Competences Review, the Business-Led Task Force on Regulation and remarks have been made to indicate that the Birds Directive is the most hated legislation in Whitehall. This, we find, does not bear with reality when we speak to business businesses themselves. 
uh, what the balance of competencies of you showed is that by and large businesses are quite happy with the way European environmental regulations work and similarly the habitats regulations review showed that actually by and large business doesn't have a problem with the way the habitat directive works. This is the case for progressive businesses that engage with the processes set out in, in these directives. Those that try to subvert them, that try to ignore the processes, inevitably run into difficulties. And that's often voices that get amplified at Westminster. But it's not just the UK that's been attacking environmental regulation. At uh, EU level, the European Commission has come under pressure from a variety of sectors and from within the Commission itself. And this has spawned the REFIT program. REFIT stands for Regulatory Fitness. This is a bit like the red tape challenge, but across all EU regulation. So it's not just the Belgian Habitat Directives that are coming in for attention. Um, in October 2013, the European Commission announced that Natural 2000 will be the subject of a fitness check as part of REFIT. So as I said, REFIT stands for a Regulatory Fitness and Performance Program. These fitness checks um, are the way the Commission assesses whether the directors are doing what they're supposed to do and as a way to detect regulatory burdens, gaps and inefficiencies and as a way to identify opportunities for simplification and perhaps even to enable the Commission to propose that legislation is revised or repealed. So they're quite serious processes in terms of the potential implications for legislation. Each fitness check examines legislation against five criteria. Uh, effectiveness, whether they are doing what they, whether the legislation is doing what it says it is supposed to do. Efficiency, whether the costs involved in implementing the legislation are justified by the changes, by the results achieved. Coherence, does the action complement other actions or other contradictions, for example, with other legislative instruments or EU policies. Relevance, is this something that you should still be doing? EU added value, is this something that is best done at EU level or is it something that's best done at national level? The Birds and Habitat Directives are not the first um, environmental instruments that have been the subject of a fitness check. In 2011, the Water Framework Directive went through a fitness check, which followed similar process and criteria. That fitness check demonstrated the need for better implementation, more complete implementation of the Water Framework Directive, and led to the EU level blueprint for water. This is not to be confused with the UK level blueprint for water. That blueprint set out a series of actions that needed to be taken in order to make implementation work better and, and complete implementation. So that was a more positive outcome, but of course at that stage the politics were less aggressive in terms of the regulatory pressure. So what are the possible consequences of this fitness check of birds and habitat directives? In the best case, perhaps it would lead to better implementation through perhaps a similar blueprint for nature, maybe improved funding, perhaps new initiatives to address uh, gaps or um, issues with the the wider environmental legislative framework around the directives. But the worst case could be a weakening of text, could mean the merger of the directives, could even lead to a threat to the Natura 2000 network of protected sites. What is very evident is that politics and also public opinion will be key to what comes out of the back of this process. On paper, the process is supposed to be an independent assessment what was made very clear from the mandate letters to the new Environment and Fisheries Commissioner, Manu Bella, was that there seemed to be um, an assumption that there would be changes and there would be a merger of the directives. The, the letter, the mandate letter to the Commissioner said, carry out a review with a view, with a view to merging and modernising these directives. So politics is playing a very big role. So why does this matter? Um, well, the Birds and Habitat Directives are a response at EU level to the failure of national intent to save nature. Uh, historical evidence shows that SSSIs were being damaged at a rate of 10 to 15% per year. 
prior to the adoption of the Habitat Directive, that rate of damage has slowed enormously. It's less than 0.1%, I think, now. These directives work and they bite. Uh, they have prevented damaging and um, ill-thought-out developments on naturally thousand sites. And so nature would certainly be in a much worse condition than it is now without these directives. At UK level, they're the backbone of existing nature legislation. They underpin the SSSI network. And they're, of course, part of a wider funding uh, and policy framework through EU legislation, including water framework directive, but also things like marine strategy framework directive, environmental impact assessment, uh, and so on. They represent the cornerstone, not just of the EU, but also a UK attempt to halt and reverse the loss of biodiversity. They are also the EU's method for addressing many of the Aichi targets adopted under the Convention on Biodiversity, as well as under other uh, multilateral environmental agreements like the Berne Convention, the Berne Convention on Migratory Species, the International Whaling Convention, and so on. So in terms of the timescales of the fitness check, uh, the consultants were appointed in October 2014 and the fitness check started in January this year. There is a consultation going on right now across all 28 member states based on a questionnaire containing 30 questions. These 30 questions are based on a mandate that was agreed for the fitness check back in September, I think, 2014. There will be uh, a public internet consultation in April this year. There will also be a more focused consultation in 10 member states, which will start early April. The draft initial report will be published September 2015 in time for a one day stakeholder workshop where the initial results will be presented and discussed. And the final evaluation report will come out sometime in early 2016. We think the Commission will publish what it plans to do in response to the evaluation at the same time as the evaluation itself is published. So in terms of opportunities for input, the, the consultation that's underway now across all 28 member states will be focusing on gathering evidence from two governmental institutions, the first being that institution responsible for Nature 80,000, the second being one chosen to be reflective of another sector that's interested in the directive. At UK level, DEFRA is the lead and DEP uh, is inputting as the second government institution. Then in one NGO, but in reality what that means is that the NGO networks have been collating a joint response in each country. So the networks of BirdLife, European Environment Bureau and WWF have been working together to provide a single response for all NGOs at national level within each member state. And then one private sector organisation in each member state. At this stage, we're not quite sure which private sector organisation that is in the UK. This will conclude either this week or next week. So the deadline is today um, for some NGO responses. And there has some Member states have been given an extension to Wednesday next week. Once this is done, there will then be a more detailed consultation in 10 selected member states. These will be chosen on the basis of representativity of geographical location, whether north, south, east, west, type of government, so centralised or devolved or federal, uh, how long the member state has been in the EU, whether it's an old or a new member state, and the extent of their natural 80,000 network. The UK will be included in the 10 member states that are coming in for more focused attention. The public internet consultation, which starts in April, there will be a three month window that will seek to gather public opinion on nature conservation, not evidence per se. The, the one day stakeholder workshop we believe will take place on September 29th, 2015, where, as I said, the results will be presented and, I guess, ground truth against what stakeholders expected or what's, what input was made by stakeholders. What, what has 
been sort of foremost from the consultant from the commission is that evidence will be key. This is an evidence-led process. Um, yes, politics will influence what happens beyond, but what the commission wants is hard evidence about how implementation is working on the ground across all 28 member states. So a, a key element of that for BES and I think for other ecologists is making the ecological case for the directive. Um, questions that have are in the questionnaire uh, that's gone around include what is the contribution of the directive towards ensuring biodiversity? It's a direct quote, what ensuring biodiversity actually means somewhat open to interpretation. What would be the likely situation in case of there having been no EU nature legislation? And do the issues addressed by the directives continue to require action at EU level? The questions are somewhat open-ended in terms of the volume of information that could be supplied. So we have been given a two-page limit for each question by the consultant, which is proving very challenging. For some questions, there is a, a huge volume of, of evidence out there um, that could helpfully inform debate about what the directives are doing for nature. In ecological terms, there are, of course, a huge number of scientific publications. The consultant has also put online at the European Commission's website a spreadsheet of scientific publications and asked for additional suggestions by the end of April. Uh, that's something that certainly the UK NGOs will be doing. So, I think um, what, I'll, what I'll talk about now is briefly sort of how inputs are working at UK level in terms of the NGO networks. Uh, the joint links, so Wildlife and Countryside Link, Scottish Environment Link, Northern Ireland Environment Link, and Wales Environment Link are all working together in a joint response, which will be submitted next week. This brings together evidence, case studies, publications from all of our networks to try and give the Commission the fullest picture possible of what's going on on the ground in the UK. The, the first questionnaire sent out to all 28 member states covers all issues, so it addresses all the questions that are in the mandate. What we understand from the Commission is that the more in-depth consultation of the 10 member states that will focus in on a more limited set of issues. So really this first questionnaire is our, our only and best opportunity to provide input across all issues. The same thing is happening across all 28 member states with the NGO networks and we believe with the government but there are some subtleties in how different governments are approaching this. So in Denmark, for example, there is a single joint response from NGOs and government and industry all working together. That, again, is, is working. Um, in other countries, I think there are different approaches being taken. In terms of input or involvement in what's going on at UK level, uh, Ben uh, is working for British Ecological Society on this. Uh, I'm working for ISPD and for the link networks on this. Um, and as I said, DEFRA are working. I don't have an email at the heart of this, but I can perhaps point anyone who's interested at the relevant person after the webinar. Okay, so that's giving you a sort of flavour of what's going on. Um, I'm open to receive a few questions if you want to know more. Uh, and perhaps have points to make or things to point me at in terms of evidence that might be useful. Okay, thank you, Alistair. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please um, go ahead and type them in that little box in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, I've got a few questions um, whilst people are having a think about that. Um, first one, Alistair, obviously, I guess the directives aren't, you know, aren't necessarily perfect piece of legislation. I know, for example, some of the annexes, you know, people would like to, you know, the potentially areas where they could get updated, kind of within the scope of the review, is it, you know, would it be possible, and would a possible outcome be that those kind of updates are made without 
opening up the whole directives for review or does it all come as a package? So uh, Ben, thanks for that. Thanks for the question. The, um, the situation is that the, the level of political pressure that's being placed on the environmental regulations at the moment makes it very unlikely that any process of revision uh, off the back of this uh, review would be purely science led. So there isn't really the option for a, a science led update to the annexes. Uh, it's also, also the case that the degree of um, legal isolation, if you like, between the annexes and the text of directives is quite variable and, and somewhat open to interpretation. So it would be impossible to be certain that any update to the annexes could be achieved without risking the other provisions of the directive being opened and changed. And that would be open to change by European Parliament and member states through co-decision process. Um, that said, there is good scientific evidence that the protection provided to the species listed in the annexes has knock-on benefits for many other species not listed in the annexes. So there is a great deal more research to be done, I think, to find out what the actual ecological benefits might be of an update. Uh, and indications are that actually it probably wouldn't be that great a benefit. At the same time, it's worth considering the political implications of that. So it would be likely to create great uncertainty for businesses. It would also be likely to launch a massive political storm. Um, and a, a revisiting of the, the battles that went on around, for example, the hunting annexes, uh, which were a cause of enormous friction uh, between bird conservation and hunting organisations. That friction has largely gone uh, with the agreement of the annexes. Um, BirdLife Europe and FACE, the Federation of European Hunting Associations, have a joint agreement that they will both implement the birds directive. And that really is an indication of the success in the birds directive in um, establishing an accepted and sustainable approach to nature conservation that accommodates the needs of hunting. Okay, so we've got a There's question a coming. Yeah, the do you want to... New initiatives which could be pressed for as part of a best case outcome. So what the evidence gathering phase has turned up uh, is a lot of evidence of a lack of funding for nature conservation. That's certainly one thing that could be addressed. And there are suggestions that what's needed is a dedicated funding instrument for nature. We, of course, have the LIFE instrument, which represents less than 0.1% of the total EU budget, which I think indicates the lack of priority that's been placed on, on financing nature conservation. On paper, nature conservation should be financed through the integration of biodiversity conservation into other sectoral policies like common agricultural policy and common fisheries policy. What the graphs I showed at the beginning really show is that that hasn't worked um, and that farm and biodiversity still decline rapidly. Uh, other initiatives that, that might be looked at uh, might be um, sorting out common agricultural policy. Uh, really, the evidence shows that that's one of the major drivers of biodiversity loss. So, on top of that, as I mentioned, the directives are still not fully implemented. So, that's something that uh, needs to be addressed urgently. So, there's another couple of questions fly in. Um, one's Left off, so I'm going to see if I can scroll uh, up a bit. Yeah, do you want to take that one from Elizabeth Elliott? I think is the next one. Yes, so Elizabeth Elliott has asked, How much of an impact do you think that the economic recession has had on our ability to fully achieve these directives? Has the focus in Whitehall been biased towards recovering the economy rather than saving biodiversity? Um, so, Elizabeth, you'll remember that this government started with a pledge to be the greenest government ever. 
Um, and since then, we've seen significant cuts to funding for biodiversity across the board. Despite the evidence that biodiversity is making a very significant contribution to the economy. So I think really policymakers that have failed to to see that, to see that biodiversity is delivering jobs, is delivering uh, economic growth, have really missed an opportunity. Um, and yes, we've seen some of the focus has been towards the economy rather than biodiversity, but we're working with um, the kind of government through things like the Nature and Wellbeing Act to try and make the case for preserving biodiversity. And there have been some results with some designation of marine sites, um, but there's still a very a lot more that could be done. Um, Okay. So Althea Davies has asked, yeah. is there a risk that focusing on effectiveness to date overlooks changes that need to be made to accommodate climate change, e.g. species? So the, the scientific evidence shows that the directives are more than capable of responding to climate change, but actually the sites that are protected are going to be important for climate change, acting as stepping off points for nature and as landing points, if you like. What's needed is taking action in the wider countryside. And one of the tools that has not been taken out as a habitat structure toolbox is that conservation action in the wider countryside to facilitate species hopping from protected site to protected site. Um, there are still those that say the directors don't mention climate change so they're not adapted to it, but actually the evidence on the ground shows that they, res they respond very well to climate change. It's, it's not, not a problem. Um, so, for, so, for example, RSPB's chain span project would be uh, something to look at that will that, that brings together some of that evidence uh, that protected areas are very important in climate change scenarios. So Jason Rees has answered, has asked uh, for info, CIEN offered to conduct the private sector evidence gathering, but we weren't taken up on this. Okay. Um, I also don't know who's working on behalf of the private sector. We understand that, that Arup was initially going to be the private sector contact, but they've declined. Sue Bell has asked, how can we keep track of when the public consultation will start and how best can we contribute? Any thoughts and views on the effectiveness of the directives? So the public consultation should be publicised through the European Commission's consultation website called Your Voice in Europe. Uh, RSPB and the joint links will certainly be working very hard to profile the public consultation widely to try and get as large a possible response to it. The best way to contribute, I think, would be to keep an eye open for that. Um, that consultation, as I said, will be on public opinion around the nature directive. So it's something that we would hope that membership organizations like DES uh, would promote. Oh, so I think you just, your connection was lost for a second there. Can you repeat from the start of that question? Sorry. So. The consultation is open to the public, and we would certainly hope that membership organisations like DES would promote the consultation to their members to make sure they have a chance to provide input. So thoughts and views on the effectiveness of the directives, really they're the, the only thing that's, that's acting to halt biodiversity loss. The ev scientific evidence shows that they're effective when they're implemented. The policy evidence shows that there's still a lot more they can give. We're also in the run up to 2020 and the uh, EU's biodiversity strategy target. The last thing you need is to distract attention away from implementation into any changes that are, the evidence suggests are not necessary. Um, so I think we would say now is not the time to make any changes. They are effective. Um, 
really the focus should be on implementation. And um, so just to pick up on Alistair's points about membership organisations and their role. Um, so the BES will be submitting a response to the public consultation when it comes out in April. And we'll be going out to our members to help us shape that response to make sure we reflect their views. Um, so those, everyone who's attending this webinar today, you'll get the full information about how to do that. And we've also got a group of people who came along to our workshop that we held in Lille um, and other people who've kind of engaged with this process with us. Um, so we'll also send you information along with that about how people can respond on behalf of their own organisations um, or as individuals as well. Um, but definitely kind of we will keep everyone informed who's signed to this webinar um, about the next um, the next steps really that BES will be taking on this. Um, so we've got another question coming in there from Jake Bickmore. Okay, Jake. Could you point in, so Jake Bickman has asked, could you point us in the direction of the source of the graphs that you showed at the beginning for scientific evidence? So those two graphs are taken from a paper submitted by Paul Donald et al. to Science in 2006. Uh, Paul Donald is working on an update of that research based on the, the latest bird structure reporting round. So the, um, I'll just jump up one. Yeah. That one? Yeah, that one. So this graph is uh, derived from data collected through the uh, Pan-European Common Bird Monitoring Scheme, PECBMS. Um, and PECBMS, there you should be able to access the data that's behind this graph of the European Wild Bird Index. The data has been compiled as part of the European Environment Agency's monitoring uh, systems for biodiversity. So. That's where you can get that graph. Uh, the second is one that, this one here, is one that um, is derived from that science paper submitted by Paul Donald. Uh, that was in Science in 2006. Um, the title was International Nature Conservation Policy Delivers Benefits for Biodiversity. Uh, guys, I understand that. Currently, there's work uh, ongoing to do an updated version of that study. Is that right, Alistair? I think that's the plan, yes. And that would be uh, we're hoping to publish that once the data from the Article 12 and 17 reports uh, is published by the European Commission again early in April. Um, so, I think a key thing which uh, Alistair mentioned earlier and a role and something which I hope that the ES members can contribute to. So the Commission has put together this list of evidence, which is which encompasses peer-reviewed papers, encompasses grey literature, reports from various governments and NGOs, um, which is the kind of evidence base that they'll be taking into account alongside the submissions they get to the consultation. Um, so we've kind of, I have kind of looked at that and um, got input from various people to add a few extra papers to that. But if anyone, what I'll do following this webinar is to send around that list and you know if anyone has any papers that they're aware of any reports that they're aware of that they don't see on that list um then please let me know and i can feed that in um and i think as uh, so that's right they'll be accepting additions to that until the end of april is that correct i believe that's correct yes great um, so I've got, I think there's a couple of people typing. So whilst they're typing there, oh, we've got another one coming here from Ruth Mitchell. I'll go to that one. So Ruth Mitchell has asked, if conservation in the wider countryside is a major problem as well, as Alistair mentioned, will the EU agri-environment schemes go through a similar assessment of fitness for purpose? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think there's a strong case for putting the whole common agricultural policy through a fitness check. Uh, but I don't believe that's in the Commission's timetable at present. Um, all the evidence points to a need to substantially reform the common agricultural policy to reduce its impact on biodiversity. Um, but I think many of you will be aware that the Commission proposed some reform, some greening of the cap in the last reform process, but these were rejected by the European Parliament and by Member States. Um, or I should say, by parts of the European Parliament. 
by the member states such that what we got out of the end of the process was a cap that was actually in some ways less green than the cap that went in at the beginning of the process. So things have gone backwards rather than forwards. Um, so I think, yes, there's a strong case, but at the moment that's not on the card. Um, I've, got, I've got another question. I was waiting for the people to type theirs. Um, for the kind of the second stage of the consultation with the, just the 10 member states, are there any particular, um, do we have any indication of what aspects that might focus on or will that be a product of what they get back in the first round? We've been told that it will be a product of what they get back from the first round, uh, but we suspect the Commission will come up with a working list of 10 with the capacity to tweak that if something else comes up, but at this stage we have no indication of what those 10 topics would be. Um, well, I imagine there are a few potential candidates, things like site designation, things like site management, but it's just guesswork on my behalf. We don't have any indication at this stage. Okay. Um, so there's another question there from Elizabeth. Yeah, so Elizabeth yes, has asked, uh, what do you think may have more influence on research? Public opinion on the value of biodiversity, etc. scientific evidence, economic cost of effective implementation. So different aspects of that will have um, more or less impact at different stages of the fitness check. So the fitness check right now is focused on gathering evidence. So the scientific evidence and the economic cost of effective implementation, those are very much front and center at the moment. Things like the Habitats Regulations Review, things like the Balance of Competences Review at UK level, things like the T report, other studies that have been done on the economic value of biodiversity. These are the kind of things that we're sending in to the consultants as UK level evidence of what the economic cost has been of implementation, what the economic benefits have been of having EU nature conservation legislation. In terms of the scientific evidence, there's of course the, the Paul Donald paper that I've mentioned about the next gen species and better. But there's also other evidence at EU level and it's been across the UK on things like uh, recovery of large carnivores across the EU, the recovery of species like the red kite and white tailed eagle numerous life projects that have been funded from the EU that have helped bring back species or helped deliver habitat conservation objectives. All of that's very important in this evidence gathering phase. The public opinion phase becomes important not now, but through beyond the end of the fitness check into the, the stage where um, the commission will decide what happens the back of the fitness check uh, and others try to implement it going on. So we're aware that the uh, UK and Netherlands governments have been working very closely together to try to steer the results of the fitness check to get what they want out of the process. Uh, this has been going on through some of the Make It Work initiative um, and through initiatives at national level in the Netherlands to do a survey in the Netherlands to come up with European perspectives for nature. So this is a national level approach that's trying to come up with lessons for nature across the whole of the EU. Um, we're certainly watching these very closely, but also working through the European Parliament to make sure that the decision makers at European level are very aware of the level of public concern about the fitness check process. Um, what that has resulted in is uh, MEPs in the European Parliament's Environment Committee giving the Environment Commissioner, Karen Vella and the Vice President for Growth and Jobs, Franz Timmermans, a very warm reception, so we say, if not hot reception, uh, over their plans for nature conservation at EU level. Um, and Franz Timmermans was heard to remark, this is giving better regulation a bad name. So I, I think public opinion is going to be very important in the latter stages, but it's, it's being felt now by those that will oversee what happens next in the fitness check process. The evidence gathering phase right now is where scientific evidence and economic evidence will be key.
Um, I was wondering, Alistair, the, uh, the outcome of the general election in the UK, will, will that have any bearing on kind of the UK government's perspective on this or are all the parties kind of along the same lines on it? Um, probably, but it's, it's anyone's guess at this stage what the actual impact will be. So a few weeks back, Murray Eagle came to speak uh, at, the, at the lodge of RSPB. Um, in response to an invitation we've sent out to all the environmental spokespersons of the main parties in the election. Uh, and she said that a Labour government would be dedicated to keeping the protection delivered by the nature directives. Um, I'm not sure what's been said by the other parties at this stage, or indeed whether they've all had a chance to give the same presentation elsewhere. Um, but what is evident is that there is considerable, there's still considerable political pressure uh, on all regulation, particularly on the environmental regulation. And, and this is despite a lot of evidence that actually environmental regulation is not a significant burden on business or on administration. So at the UK level, there was something called the Administrative Burdens Measurement Exercise in 2006, which looked at the administrative burden of all of DEFRA's regulations. And this found that the habitats regulations represented such a tiny administrative burden that they were recorded as 0% overall administrative burden. So at EU level, the Stoiber Group was also looking at administrative burdens at a different level, and again found that the habitats directive represented a tiny, insignificant burden, if any. Um, so th there's a lot of political rhetoric around what a terrible thing environmental regulation is, but the evidence does not back that up. So we will have to see what the political rhetoric is from the new UK government. Um, after the May election and after any subsequent election, if there is one immediately <laughs> after. Yeah, it, um, it was something which was which was touched on briefly at our debate that we held um, last week. Um, there were probably no concrete kind of answers to the to the question. I think um, broadly, it was a broadly pro. -y, Kind of directors' response, um, with the exception of um, UKIP, who obviously their issue is with, is with Europe. So, um, you know, well, uh, kind of what clear. is evident from EU level uh, surveys of, of public opinion is that there is a very high level of support across the whole of the EU for EU environmental legislation and also in the UK. So a survey found that 77% of European citizens on average supported EU environmental legislation. In the UK, that was 67%. So even in a country perceived as being highly Eurosceptic, there is significantly more than half the citizens support EU environmental legislation. It's one area, perhaps the only area, where UK citizens trust the EU. So whichever government is in power and whether they have a referendum or not, the environmental benefits of EU membership are one way that, um, that staying in the EU could be sold to citizens. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. So if, if anyone else has any other questions um, or any comments or particular thoughts based on uh, your experience uh, working with the directors, I know we've got people here who work in consultancy, work um, as academics, any any comments or views from your experience would be very welcome. Um, so just kind of one more from me, Alistair. Um, in terms of the, the public consultation, um, do we know kind of what format that will take? And, you know, if, if people are interested in responding to that, um, either kind of personally or on behalf of their organisations, will there be would it be a kind of you know opportunity to submit lots of information? Will it be a yes no tick box? Uh, do we have any ideas about that? We're pretty sure it's going to be a yes no tick box with perhaps one box for free text towards the end. That that's how previous consultations have worked. 
the Commission is not a uh, an example of best practice in terms of public consultations. Um, the uh, EU level networks, BirdLife, EEB, and WWF, are working with Friends of the Earth um, on a um, a web tool to facilitate responses to the public consultation. The consultation is likely to be 20 or more questions about quite inaccessible aspects of nature conservation. Um, things that I think the average member of the public will look at and say, what on earth does this mean? So the, the Friends of the Earth are working on a web tool that will enable people to understand what those mean and make a rapid response to the consultation. So at this stage, it's a bit of a watch this space, um, but keep an eye on the yes, the BES website and also RFPD websites where more information will be available in due course. Okay, great. I think we just had someone typing away there. I think it was Jason, so I'll um, just give him a minute to finish his question. Um, and so I'm just trying to think if there's any other points that I've got. In terms of the, the kind of more detailed consultation, the 10 member state one, um, will that again be operating in the same way with kind of one NGO or this is our, you know, as is the case in the UK, group of NGOs as Wildlife and Finnish Side Link coordinating a response, or will they be going out to other organisations directly? So, so for that, we think the net will be cast more wider um, to more organisations, but it's not going to be the same as the balance of competencies workshops where there were sometimes 30 to 50 people uh, in the workshop. I think it's likely to be more like 20 or so people around a table um, for a one-off. Um, half day workshop but the, the way it's run is in the gift of DEFRA um, and we've not had any information on exactly how that will work yet. Okay. okay so if anyone's got any further questions um, please submit them now otherwise we've got a couple minutes left and um, I'll wrap up so we've got a couple coming in <laughs> so please do submit them um, so I think just to, whilst people are typing any final questions, just to kind of reiterate opportunities to get involved uh, through the BES with this. Um, I'll send around an email to everyone who's um, attended the webinar uh, later today. Um, there's a couple of opportunities to get involved straight away. I think the first one is um, by, I'll send around the list of evidence that the Commission has put together. Um, and if, if you know of any published papers or reports that's not missing from that, please let me know and I can feed those in before the end of April. Then once the public consultation is live, I'll also go out to people for their views to input into that. Um, and then also if there are any other opportunities arise um, with this kind of 10 member state consultation that we can input into, um, we again will be going out to BES members to shape our response to that. Um, got one more question coming there from Sue Bell, Alistair. So Sue's asked, how will DEFRA interact with the Scottish Parliament, Northern Ireland and the Welsh Assemblies? So I understand that DEFRA has sent out the questionnaire to the stakeholder list that it had for the Habitats Regulations Review, which was of course an England only review. Um, I believe they've been in touch with SNH and CCW and Natural England, but I don't think there are any plans to involve the assemblies, the devolved assemblies. Uh, at this stage, it's very much an evidence gathering process. Um, certainly, the Northern, the joint links are doing our best to make sure that the UK NGO response reflects the um, the myriad good work that's being done uh, in the uh, devolved countries. Um, with examples of life projects and examples of best practice. Um, so, yes, good question. Probably you can <laughs> point at DEFRA <laughs> to ask how they are engaging with the, uh, the various assemblies. Okay, great. Thank you, Alistair. Okay, so if we don't have any more immediate questions, um, it's just about 12 o'clock, so we've had our hour. Um, so I think I'll start to draw things to a close. If anyone has any further questions, then please do get in touch with me. Um, you know, we're keen, as with all our policy work, that it kind of really reflects the views of our members. If we've got one more question maybe being typed there from Jason. Please go ahead, Jason, and type it. We've got a minute or so left. I'm likely to get turfed out very soon, so. 
<laughs> okay, yeah, same here. <laughs> we can fit one more in. Um, yes, yeah, please do get in touch with any questions post this. Um, and as I said, I'll be in touch later today um, with an email um, detailing different ways that you can interact with this process. Um, Jason just says thank you for sharing his knowledge and insights. Um, so I think that's a, a nice way to end. Um, I think I'd like to um, reflect that as well. So thank you very much, Alistair, for taking the time to um, to speak to us and to yeah to share your deep knowledge and insights. I know you've been working very hard on the, the consultation response and have been fully immersed in it over the last few weeks. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we'll leave you to, to get back to that. Um, thank you everyone for joining the webinar. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. As I said before, it's a new format for us, so we're trying it out. So any feedback, uh, we're very welcome. You should get an automated feedback form um, through Quick Webinar. So please do put your thoughts in there. Um, and yeah, so I think uh, with that, I think I'll draw the webinar to a close. Alistair, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone all the way around the UK um, for joining us uh, for this webinar. Um, and I will be in touch later today with some follow up. Thank you very much. Cheers.